Node.js <coughs> lighting. Turn my monitor down. <coughs> Tell me if this is loud enough. see chat there yes hi Chris hi, Tommy Tyson space kitter and Luke do the numbers pick up a little bit all right let me just draw something and we can get into it yeah that's good uh, <clears throat> All right, Tyson. How are people going? <coughs> Pause my that stream there. I'll draw the thing. Let's push it over. Short exact sequence. All right, so we're just going to talk a little bit about what this. Uh, of means in concrete terms and also a little example and then we're gonna get on to delta sets delta sets Tyson can catch up. All right, so what does this mean? So it's a short exact sequence for each uh, for each n. So what does that mean concretely? So if we have a function x n to r so that's going to be an element of the the sort of nth module here then we have a map which takes that and returns let's call this g so it returns a pair of maps which is the restriction, oh, no, we'll just write it as restriction. So G restricted to UN, G restricted to VN. Like so. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe I should just recall that I have UN and VN subsets of XN such that these all collect together for 0, 1, 2 they collect together give um, combinatorial surfaces and this assignment from the map G to the pair of maps uh, this is an injective function. Uh, 
sorry, Just looking at the chat. Um, <clears throat> this is injective, uh, and moreover, this being a short exact sequence means that if I have a pair of func functions, turn myself down, this is very distracting. If I have a pair of functions um, from, let's see, h from u enter r and k from v enter r, given these, if h restricted to the intersection is equal to k restricted to the intersection uh, there's a function on xn to r <coughs> restricts to the given functions. Um, all right. And then, uh, yep. All right, so we know we can build functions on x, n, out of functions on u, n, and Vn, as long as they agree on the overlap. Uh, yes, uh, JS, that's right. So let me. So this here is this here. Yeah, so uh, the fact that um, <clears throat> yeah, short exact sequence means this map that I've put a little star on has to be injective. I mean, we look at it and you go, well, it's injective by construction. And then the, the image of star versus the image of double star which is sort of what's happening here. Right, so the image of star has to be the uh, the kernel of double star, and double star, remember, restricts and then takes a difference. So maybe I'll uh, redo this one. Come on, eraser. Whoa, that died. This is an old iPad, and hopefully this is all still. Yeah, man. Ah, oh, man. All right, everyone. Hit F in chat. That was yesterday. Oh, it's the it's the scrolling with two fingers thing. It zooms just a little bit sometimes when I move, and I keep wanting a little bit more space. Okay. Anyway, oh, someone's got themselves an emote. So, anyway, I said what I wanted to say about that. So, uh, Tyson never said that he came back. So, I hope you're back, Tyson, and seeing all this glorious adventure. Otherwise, uh, that screen's gone. You'll see it in the scan notes. All right. <clears throat> anyway, just, it's just wanted to point out that at the level of the uh, the cochain complexes, this is relatively straightforward. Ah, uh, my left my iPad died, and software didn't save what I'd written. 
oh yeah really the app died um, I've literally just copied out half a page from my notes and you'll see it in the scan there's no extemporizing no extra no we didn't wait because it's like 10 minutes later uh, the double star map oh yes that's what I was gonna write so the double star map thank you um, Chris so let's, let's say a specific one uh, it's this so a thing in here is a pair of functions um, even better H from U into R and K from V into R so I called this double starred for those who saw what I had before and uh, what it does it sends this pair of functions to H restricts the intersection minus K restricted to the intersection and so what I was about to write was uh, I had a, the restriction of H equals the restriction of K I was just trying to rewrite that to say the restriction of H minus the restriction of K equals zero which is the same thing so if um, if this side equals zero there is a unique in fact G mapping from X n to R I should write up here what did I have I had U n and V n sitting inside X n and the U n's and V n's all patched together to give a, uh, a combinatorial surface okay so that's just saying that if I have a function defined on a pair of subsets of a bigger set that's the union of the two subsets if they agree on the overlap then they define a function a single function on the whole thing all right <clears throat> and this is relatively straightforward compared to what we see at the level of cohomology so at the level of cohomology you don't get this nice behavior uh, we just say well I take something that's a um, representative in the cohomology module I can't do this patching like this All right, so I'm going to give you an example of this setup so here example so I'm going to take X to be the tetrahedron the boundary of the tetrahedron Put the orientations on here just to remind everyone um, so then I take U to be for instance um, Tess yes that's true um, because the UN and the VN together cover XN I mean if you had uh, something in XN that wasn't in the union then you don't know how to define the function there um, or you could define it to be arbitrary and so that doesn't work All right, so here's a here's a thing um, let's take u to be this pair of uh, triangles and v to be this pair of triangles Yeah, it's not a partition Chris it's just uh, two sets that union up to give X hopefully I said that somewhere if I didn't then uh, 50 lashes
Ah, like this. All right. Naughty corner. So then, <clears throat> yeah, so I've written u equals and v equals here. And this is a little bit schematic. You can write down there like u2 is the pair consisting of these triangles and so on. But now the intersection uh, is going to be this wireframe thing. Um, where these are these are field triangles, and everything in here is field. So, and this turns out to be the same as. Uh, now, which way did I do it? So it's basically this polyhedron type of picture we've got uh, that we sort of use as an example. So we can calculate the cohomology of this with what we have. Um, <clears throat> I should write out V is also uh, this way, is two triangles glued together. These are filled in and U is this pair of triangles going the other way. one okay so the the tetrahedron is a union of these two squares these triangulated squares along this directed graph which is just a, a polyhedron a square an unfilled square so this is a kind of situation you might think about because uh, the cohomology of a directed graph that's a single cycle is relatively easy to calculate. And uh, for those who are already thinking topologically, these uh, cohomologies here of the, the, the subdivided squares, they are, well, it's like a physical spatial square which is contractible if you know what that means All right so the cohomology of that it will turn out to be um, rather simple but then the cohomology of the tetrahedron is not trivial and so something funky has to happen about how uh, the information in the cohomology of u and v and u intersection v fit together somehow All right, any questions so far? And thanks for picking me up on things that I slightly didn't say. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the best use, but it's uh, it's helpful. Teaching makes you think about material um, in a slightly different way than thinking about it for one's own pleasure. <clears throat> oh yeah, so someone put the link to um, Richard Borchard's um, lectures in uh, Discord. So if anyone doesn't know, he's a Fields Medal winner and he's basically putting out a lecture a day on YouTube about all kinds of stuff. It's really, really cool. It's just taking the opportunity to, I mean, uh, he's in lockdown, so just spreading the love. All right. <clears throat> So I might just mention there's another way to do this where you, instead of chopping the, the tetrahedron in half with two triangles, um, you just rip one face off and you make like a little alcove.
and a single face like this and then the intersection looks like uh, a single the boundary of a single triangle so that's another uh, way which uh, one can do it all right so for those who've been waiting with bated breath delta sets a delta set is so we have a bunch of sets For each non-negative integer, and uh, we have face maps. So now I runs between zero and K. And we have a condition and we've seen it before in um, slightly just in the two-dimensional case so we can move dj past di at the cost of lowering it in index down by one and this is for all J greater than I. Uh, Tyson. I'm not sure what you mean there. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I see. This is K greater than or equal one. Yeah, x minus 1 makes sense. Just put it to be a single point. Uh, Madpad, I'm not sure about um, the in-person lectures being recorded. Okay, so this is a delta set. It's super uh, star is okay yeah for x minus one but um, let's not uh, dwell on it too much <clears throat> that's a whole nother story that I'm not going to visit in this course ah uh, yeah madpad they generally do that so the uh, um, you know people taking courses that are far apart from each other can overlap okay so examples directed graphs And combinatorial surfaces. <clears throat> Alright, so that's something we've seen so far, but whatever. So more ex more interesting, that's like example zero. So one. So here we go. We're gonna actually in introduce this notation properly. Um it's not meant to be bold, I just drew it badly. Okay, so this is the, called the combinatorial in N simplex. Yeah, so we can 
we can get delta 3 for instance so what is this so we have to specify a bunch of sets for each non-negative uh, integer and some face maps so zero simplices this this set is precisely the set of numbers between zero and n inclusive and i'm going to call this uh, n plus one also uh, n plus one bold but here it's just underlined <clears throat> so if you're teching uh, make it bold slash math bf uh so then what's what are the one simplices or the edges it's a set of two element subsets of this set and in fact what you do is the k simplices is the set of k element subsets of bold n plus one and then so that's k plus one elements and then delta n n the n simplices there's a single n plus one element subset of old n plus one. So that's that itself. This might call like the top face. And then all the higher ones are empty. Because there are no like n plus five element subsets of bold n plus one, for instance. So this definition is is uniform. This works for all k. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So if you use uh, k equals minus one here, uh, this still works because there's one no element subset, namely the empty set. But then k equals minus two, it doesn't work. So we just ignore that but let's not go down to k equals minus one i'm just this definition is quite robust put it that way okay so what do we have so this is our sets now we have to have the face maps so we will note uh let's, let's call it s inside um No, we need the braces uh, DMN because it's the set with one element, which is all the elements of n plus one. Whereas if I had no braces, uh, it would have n plus one elements. Yeah, so this, uh, let me even highlight, this definition works for all uh, k greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and the size of these things are the binomial coefficients, basically. Well, they are the binomial coefficients. Um, yeah, it's, it's literally like uh, n plus 1, choose k plus 1. Okay, so if I'm given a general subset, uh, let's say with s 
is k plus 1. So this is an element of delta n k. Then, uh, so for instance, here's one. Let's take n equals 5. So the, the bold n plus 1 has five, uh, sorry, has six elements. And I can say take k equals 2, in which case I could take 1, 3, and 5 for an example, then this is ordered, right? Any subset S has a given ordering because it's a subset of an ordered set. This is a standard ordering. So for instance, this S is ordered in the, in the way that I've written it down. And so we define di to omit ith element where, and this is important, we start counting from zero. So people who are computer science type people, uh, coders may appreciate the fact we keep starting our indexing from zero. So in this case, I've got zeroth, first, and second elements of S. And so when I discard an element, then I have a two element subset. So that's going to be an element of uh, delta five, one. I should say so. <clears throat> All right, so that's some lovely combinatorics. And when you do really serious um, grown up algebraic topology, um, homotopy theory, you'll be surprised at the amount of it that is actually just combinatorics and figuring out properties of structures like this with various restrictions and functions and so on. Okay. All right. Example two. Not going good. Um, do you want S? Uh, yes. Yeah, good, Chris. That's a good. Let's let's do an actual. So D one of S is one five. D zero of S is, and this is where we start to see the whole pattern emerge about like D zero and D one for directed graphs. You sort of go. The opposite way to what you expect because what the subscript on the D is doing is specifying what you throw away and D0 is the first thing and the edges are ordered and so well the zero sorry the D0 is to throw away the zeroth thing and because your your edge and your directed graph is ordered from the, the sort of the lower to the higher <coughs> yeah JS it all makes sense you know, to insert like mind blown dot gif here. All right. So example two. All right. So this is now going to be the for all n version of when I wrote before uh, the tetrahedron as sort of partial delta three. Yep, Charles, you got it in uh, in Discord. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, you guys aren't memeing much in in Discord. 
You gotta up your game. All right. So, all right, let's find this thing. In fact, it's a whole lot easier. Uh, we've done sort of the hard work for now, at least for this case. Uh, so what we have is we define uh, the k simplices is going to be the same as delta n k for k between zero and n minus one. Yeah. Our tests. Yeah, well, you got to put a picture to it. And then, uh, uh, mid lecture distracting me. Okay, more seriously. So for every k between 0 and n minus 1, we keep the same set of k simplices. Right? So if we're thinking about our delta 3, so what is it? It's got the... We build it up out of the set 0, 1, 2, 3. It's got four things. And look at the various subsets. So the single four-element subset, that's everything, uh, is like the field tetrahedron and we just throw that away but we keep all the lower ones or the triangles and so on um okay so done um d i as before with the exception that uh, now the face maps from delta n n well, that's equal to empty set are the sort of canonical boring maps from the empty set to anything. Okay. So this is the boundary. I call this the boundary of the n-simplex. Okay, but we can... Um, we can generalize this idea now let me just sort of highlight this idea here is what I did is I took an existing delta set and I threw away some information above a certain dimension so we can alright so maybe memeing in discord during lectures is a uh, yeah, is is distracting for all involved. Uh, outside lectures go your hardest. All right, but so here's so more generally, let me write down a def general definition. It's let's start with a. A delta set. We call it the n skeleton. So S K N of X. Let's see. It has. Uh, so we look at its k simplices. It's the same as the k simplices of x for k up to n, but after that it's empty. And face maps as before, excepting the ones that are higher up, which we just throw away. So what I wrote down, uh, so we have... Um, the boundary of the n simplex is the n minus one skeleton of the the thing that I shouldn't have written. Okay. And 
uh, just a subsidiary definition as so if some delta set x is equal to one of its own skeletons uh, x is equal to skn x so it's called at most n dimensional and if in addition uh, if x is not equal to the n minus one skeleton we just say it's n-dimensional and if it's not n-dimensional for any uh, <coughs> uh, rephrase this if it's not equal to any of its skeleta called infinite dimensional oh, yeah. so uh, okay so for an example of the latter uh, phenomenon So, if we have a delta set P, maybe let's call it P sub infinity. Um, P sub infinity and have a bunch of brackets here. So the K simplices, there's a single K simplex of P infinity for all K. This is infinite dimensional. So we had a, a version of this before where we had a, a combinatorial surface P where it had a single vertex, a single edge, and a single triangle. Um, we have um, so we have delta N is n dimensional boundary is n minus one dimensional uh, and an n skeleton is at most n dimensional Oh yeah, infinite peep. Yeah, because if we if we so if we take like S K N of S K N of X, that's just S K N of X. And even better, uh, if you have S K M of S K N, and M is greater than or equal to N. That's so just a <clears throat> R of DMN. Very well done. Repeat. Add infinitum. Um, okay. I have one more example of a of a delta set. What are those superscripts? Oh, that's a L. Uh, that's it's dimensional, but I just want to like scrub out the majority of the letters. Uh, 
Ah, uh, yeah, Pete, the king of infinite space. <clears throat> I'm not sure if anyone but DMN will get that one, but it's all right. Uh, okay, so here's another example that was sort of an aside. Um, Enciona. Yeah. Right, so here's an example of a delta set, which I'm going to denote delta 1 times delta 2. So I hope people are getting the idea that it's... Um, like, we can be very concrete with these things. Ah, oh, MadPad, good on you. Thanks for waiting. I've got to keep my focus. Um, yeah, so these things are very combinatorial, very concrete. And so, like, this is just finite sets, various functions, and we go to cohomology, we linearize everything, and you can just calculate your little heart out. Okay, so this is just a name for now. Okay, so and what I'm going to do is I'm going to work down. I'm going to work from the uh, the higher dimensional simplices because it's slightly easier to work that way. Uh, so delta one times delta two k equals all right so if k is bigger than three it's empty so this is going to be at most three-dimensional all right so this is going to be however long it needs to be so if k equals three it has three uh three simplices and they are labelled by the following sets. So 0, 1, 2, and then another element I'm calling 2 bar. The next one is 0, 1, 1 bar, 2 bar. And the last one is 0, 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar. There's three elements. I had another COVID test this morning. My nose is just, ah. Uh, it seemed like the uh, person taking the test left the swab in slightly longer than was necessary. Either that or it went so far up, it took a while to pull out. <laughs> okay, so now for k equals 2, uh, let's put little fences here. Yeah, I mean, I could be, I could have some swelling inside or whatnot, I don't know. Um, Okay, so for k equals 2, now you mentioned it, now my nose is getting more itchy. Okay, uh, for k equals 2, what we do is we look at the set of two element subsets of these. Okay, so what you can do is you can take each of these three sets, like 0, 1, 2, 2 bar. Ah, uh, Tyson, I've been I've been feeling perfectly fine. It's uh, just interstate travel standard procedure. It's not because I'm symptomatic. Um, yeah, so if, say if I take uh, 0, 1, let's, let's put my example over here. So I take 0, 1, 2, and 2 bar. And so this has some subsets, namely like 0, 1. Uh, sorry, this should be 3 element. Sorry, that's 3 element. 
so 0, 1, 2, uh, 0, 1, 2 bar. Uh, what else do we have? We have 1, 2, 2 bar. We have, uh, well, <coughs> should have one more. Uh, that one, that one, oh, 0, 2, 2 bar. Okay. So these are three element subsets, but note that um, some of these are subsets of the other ones as well. So uh, uh, 0, 1, 2 bar, this one happens to be a subset of this one as well. Right, so we don't count things twice. We just look at all these three sets, look at all their possible three element subsets, and there'll be some duplicates. So we just take them once each. And there's uh, 10 of these. This has 10 elements. Uh, yeah, they're all thrown in together. So here's four of them, and then I go through the other two. So I've I've looked at the um, the subsets of I've looked at the subsets of the first one here. I get these four subsets, and then I do the same for here and for here. I get four each, but when I consider them all together, there's some overlap. So this subset appears in the list for this one. So I don't count it twice. So naively you get 12 things, but there's some double counting. So you don't double count them. Now we take this for K equals uh, one, a set of two element. All right, so maybe one thing to think about is that these three element subsets, <coughs> the, the three things uh, no, uh, zero bar one, that's correct, Tess. So these three element subsets are the vertices of a triangle. Put that in. And these, each of these in k equals 3, these are meant to be three simplices, i.e. tetrahedra. So these are vertices of a tetrahedron. Uh, so these four things in here, in each of these, are the vertices of the three tetrahedra. And there's 10 triangles. So maybe I should write that instead. Three, ten triangles, <clears throat> and here I've got. Uh, so these are two element subsets, and you sort of repeat the procedure. So there's uh, twelve edges. And each of these <clears throat> two things in this two element subset are, are the ends of the edge. And the edges are ordered because uh, we have all like the ordering on 0, 1, 2. Yeah, we don't have a list of the edges tests. Yeah, so the ordering implies the direction. So what we have is all the bar things come after the unbarred things. So I'll note this um, a bit further down. We've got a general uh, thing which I'll describe more uh, briefly, but I'm just working through this one because I can actually draw it. Yeah, so I can pick. So I can do things like, let me just pick this one. 
I get 0 to 0 to bar and 2 to bar. And these these are vertices that the endpoints of a directed edge where it points from the smaller to the bigger. And when I draw a picture of it, you can start um, drawing little cartoons yourself. <clears throat> All right, I continue my little brace. Uh, I've done a fence. Okay, now it says k equals zero. Now this is just the set of all eight, um, sorry, six things. So now I've, I haven't got nested braces. It's zero, one, two, zero bar, one bar, two bar. So it's the set of one element subsets, but that's just the elements. And there's, uh, what are these, six vertices. Like one element subsets. Yeah, so when we look at, for instance, the, the triangles, like 0, 1, 2 bar, that puts an ordering on the vertices of the triangles, which is how we get our standard picture of the, the edges and we think of the, the triangle as oriented, or the tetrahedron, like 0, 1, 1 bar, 2 bar, my all my edges, which are pairs of things, are ordered, so I can order the edges and then the faces are what they should be and then there's somehow an orientation on the whole solid tetrahedron. Okay, so this whole thing um, test, let's see, does it distinguish between the set of elements and the set oh. A set of subsets of one element. So, I mean, maybe. I'm not being too pedantic. Working up to isomorphism. I mean, these are just convenient labels, um, and then the functions do what they should do. When you write this down in practice, you don't sort of worry too much about, um, like, should these be braces around zero, braces around one, or anything like that. You can think of them as convenient labels. Okay, so what is what do the face maps do? So so just looking at this, right? <clears throat> looking at the the tetrahedra, the three simplices. Each element in the set of tetrahedra is a little ordered set, and so I can think of it like I did for delta n. Um, and I can order them, counting from zero, and throw away the ith element. So D1, uh, say, of um, 0, 1, 2, 2 bar is 0, 2, 2 bar. I mean, it's a coincidence that the D, the zeroth position is a zero. Um, let's say D0 of... One, two, two bar is two, two bar. All right. And I'm going to draw a picture and then we'll have our break. Um, a little bit wonky. I 
cross over this weight up. No, go this one. Okay, here's a picture of it, and I think I need that one there. And that one there. And the labels are 0, 1, 2, 1 bar, 0 bar, 2 bar. Yeah, sorry. So whoever put that GIF in chat, well, let's say two GIFs, three GIFs. It's probably lagging things for me. So let me just switch to a different Discord channel. Go away. Do something else. What are you doing? All right. I don't know if that's better. Um, <clears throat> I'll spam some space in, in Discord. No, that's all right. It's good to see. But uh, we can spam some replies so it pushes it out of the window. Anyway, so here's a picture. The vertices are 0, 1, 2, 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar. And the tetrahedra is 3 tetrahedra. Um, stuck together. So I encourage you to stare at this for a bit and maybe look at some of the options from the description above and see what they look like. So it's, it turns out that uh, delta 1 times delta 2 is three-dimensional because it's highest non-empty. Um, Razor, that might be a good idea just so it stops at force loading. If my computer is slow and GIFs are a bad video format. All right, cool. Let's have a quick break. We are on track. Now, Rabelais Dick too. So, <clears throat> yeah, I practiced drawing that so much. When I first wrote my algebraic topology notes, <clears throat> it's different to what you see in Hatcher, and I think it's clearer. At least I stared at it enough that it's um, obvious. So uh, presumably you mean this glorious little sketch here, Razor. This is a, uh, it's a Toblerone basically. Standing on its end. Except instead of made out of uh, wedges, it's made out of tetrahedra. Better go to the. All right, thanks, Tess. Come on. What? That's going on. Come on, Mad Pad. Where is it? Or are you making it? Oh, that's no, going to be an off-topic. 
yeah maybe put all the memes in off topic and then I can have chat open see yeah so Tyson how do you cut the ocean in half yeah Chris that's right I drew a picture of Pete earlier it was looked like a weird cross hatch cross hatched disc <clears throat> ah seesaw all right yeah so delta one so delta one delta zero is a point chris delta yeah one is a line delta zero is a point delta two is a triangle delta three is a tetrahedron so when you do um <clears throat> yeah so if you thought of it as an actual space as a topological space and then you take um, the Cartesian product of a unit interval with a triangle, a subset of the plane, you get something that looks like this. But this is now a combinatorial description of it, and it's triangulated. Just going to spam some space in lecture chat. Ah, okay, sure, okay. I didn't need to, but never mind. Thought it was doing something weird but it was doing something fixed all right <clears throat> who was going to go out for a, a stretch who was it uh Deus x Okay, we're all back. <clears throat> Apart from people who needed to leave anyway. Okay, so in general, I'm not going to do it in such great detail, but we can um, we can uh, outline how it goes. <clears throat> so in general, so let me just write. This is technically lecture ten from here on down. So in general, we can do delta one times delta n and it's n plus one dimensional um, and how do we do it <clears throat> so we have uh, n plus one n plus one simplices Okay, that looks a bit weird, um, but what are they? 
they look like this. So we start with 0, 1 up to n, n bar, and then we slowly move down. Right, so we have a, a 0, 1 up to n minus 1, and then an n minus 1 bar. N. And you slowly move it down. 0, 1. Uh, k, k bar, n, all the way down to uh, 0, 1 bar. Uh, no, that's not right. Where did I do it? Lost my picture. Zero, zero bar. N bar. Okay, so there's you can check there's n plus one of these. And then uh, these are ordered. And then you can get all the rest of the, the simplices by repeatedly applying face maps to them. So di equals omit the ith element. And I might just say this generates. the rest of the things. Yeah, so you, you apply one of the DIs and you throw out an element and then you apply another like DJ, throw out another element and you do this for all possible um, options until you get down to single element sets. So the zero simplices, or the vertices, um, <clears throat> So delta 1 times delta n, 0 is simply the set of all the, the unbarred numbers and all the barred numbers. And so this has uh, 2n plus 2 elements. Okay, and so uh, maximal DMN, um, I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, Space Kitter, um, I'm not really going to go there right now, maybe if ever. There's a way to do delta M times delta N. It's more complicated than this. Because it's like taking a pair of sort of topological an M simplex and an N simplex. You know, there's subsets of Euclidean space that look like high dimensional tetrahedra. Take their product and then somehow triangulate them into um, <coughs> uh, M plus N simplices. Yeah, I, I can't remember how many there are off the top of my head. I anticipate we might only need this one so but this is just to show there's like a non-trivial way to build these things yeah so technically <coughs> arbitrary delta sets x and y you can do x times y but it's not just like xn times yn like with the n simplices because it's an n simplex times an n simplex but in fact, generally you have to do an M simplex times an N simplex and then cut it up into different things that actually look like tetra um, look like simplices. So it's complex, but let's let's not worry about that. <clears throat> okay, so that's a stack of examples. So here's so because we have things, we want maps between them. So a map 
of Delta sets. Uh, let's call it F from X to Y is so we have functions from Xn to Yn. Right, so everything we've done for combinatorial surfaces basically has an analog for uh, oh, is my video lagging? OBS is bad frame rate. It's not cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there are analogs for these high dimensional things, infinite dimensional things. And, and I have to have a condition so it maps an n simplex to an n simplex. No, Chris, uh, xn is just the set of n simplices. Oops, want this one. So SKN is uh, the, like SKN of X is the N skeleton. So it sends a triangle to a triangle, a tetrahedron to a tetrahedron and in all dimensions. So it has a condition. that's compatible with the face maps so let's have a bunch of examples of these um, all right So, everyone maps to P, uh, the P infinity. Because it just sends any n simplex to the unique n simplex of P infinity. Uh, the, the condition on face maps immediately above uh, is is vacuous. So here's a, a constraint this gives us. So if there exists a map of delta sets and y is um, let's say y is n dimensional right, so it has yeah, so space kitter P infinity is terminal. It's the the delta set such that every other delta set admits exactly one map to it. So if Y is n dimensional, this implies X has an upper bound on its um, on its dimension. Because if y is n-dimensional, then it has no n plus 1 simplex. And so you cannot map an n plus 1 simplex of x to y because there is no thing, right? It's, there is no uh, non-trivial function from a non-empty set to an empty set. So this is... Um, Later on, we'll see this is a slight defect. <clears throat> so, for instance, you think about the point being delta zero, that's zero dimensional. And so, no delta set maps to uh, delta zero unless it's itself zero dimensional or empty. But for the purposes of like playing around with things and doing complication computations, seeing the concepts, this is all good. Later on, we'll improve our uh, technology <clears throat> so that all these problems get fixed up. Um, so here's another example. All the Skeleta 
include into each other. And so on, all the way. And all of them sit inside X. That's going the wrong way, I want that one. Um, okay. <clears throat> so actually now we can say something a little bit stronger, that SKN is a functor from delta set to delta set where delta set is the category with objects delta sets and morphisms is maps of these uh, even better um, if we define delta set less than or equal to n as a category of at most n-dimensional delta sets, then It lands uh, inside this, which is a, a subcategory, because we're just taking some of the objects of delta set, and in this case, at least, we're just taking all the 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 maps between them. So, if you know what this is, it's a full. If you don't, that's not a big deal. But that's just a terminology one can hang one's hat on if, if you know what it means. Um, here's some more examples. So that's kind of a nice little lemma. Here's another example of a map, or a pair of maps, in fact. So let's take delta 1 times delta n, and then... <clears throat> uh, delta N has two maps into it that are completely different. So what does it do? It takes uh, a K simplex and sends it to, well this left map sends it to itself. And if I take the same thing on the other side, so it might not have three or more elements, but it's just a generic uh, thing here. This one sends it to the same thing, but with uh, the bar notation. These are so. What does it do? Let's uh, draw the thing again because it looks beautiful. And then uh, that doesn't look right. It's missing one. There we go. Um, <clears throat> what we can do is you can include uh, up here. Sorry, I, 
apologies if the colors are bad, but we should arrange them just for spatial distancing, like so. Uh, it's not a co-product space kitter. Co-product is a disjoint union. <clears throat> So this is like, um, when you say, let's have a, um, let's have a circle times an interval. And then I have two functions for the circle into that cylinder. One is including it at one end of this and one is including it at the other end. Except here it's not a cylinder, it's more like a solid thing. It's a three-dimensional object made up of solid simplices. So here this is a uh, zero bar, one bar, two bar, a uh, zero, one, two. This is uh, n equals two example. Okay. So this is something you can do. Um, I probably should mention it because that's that's quite reasonable. Um, <clears throat> given two delta sets, we can make a new one, x disjoint union y. It's a delta set. It's k simplices are the disjoint union of the k simplices of the other two. And we have maps uh, called in left and in right, which just take like a k simplex of x and then inject it into the disjoint union. So it's then a k simplex of which is an element of the disjoint union of xk, disjoint union of yk. Um, okay. So a small stretchy break. Oh. Any questions? Check some of the other on Discord. Ah, uh, no. Ah, oh, Tess. I saw your. Uh... Yeah, it's gold. All right. Uh, delta one times. Um. It would be a functor if I defined it for <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. <clears throat> Break time's over. Um so DMN, um it would be a functor if I uh defined it for arbitrary delta sets. Oh my coffee cup, this is T. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Is that visible? Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, so Chris, um, Mass Overflow did a swag giveaway some years ago for um, people who had been particularly active um, on on the site and had collected magic internet points enough. Um, <clears throat> so 
apparently uh, apparently I had enough. So a couple of stickers, a mug, and a white t-shirt with a little logo on it. Who wears a white t-shirt? <clears throat> I mean, I'm a middle-aged dad now, but I I'm not I'm not wearing a white t-shirt. All right. Okay, so here's some maps. So here's another thing, which uh, I'm going to uh, another construction. We can do push-outs. So push-outs are all the rage. All the cool kids are doing them. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use. Yeah, I. Some people can pull it off. I'll say. <laughs> Sorry. Tyson is from Adelaide, everyone else. And now that I think about it. Yeah, that's. He's not a middle aged dad either. Um, anyways, let's do this. So we can do push outs. So, uh, Z, Y, X, let's call this Q and P for lack of better, um, uh, letters. And so this is generalizing the, the disjoint union because, um, if Z is empty, like all its sets of K simplices are empty, then it reduces to the previous example. So we have uh, this piece of notation here that tells me that this is a push-out square and I will extend the notation in left, in right and this is just the notation that says the K simplex here is a K simplex, well, or of X or a K simplex of Y and I quotient this by an equivalence relation. Uh, which is that uh, P of Z generated by this equivalence relation. P of Z is equivalent to Q of Z for all Z in Z K. Okay, so P and Q maps of delta sets. So in particular, if P and Q are injective everywhere, um, then like on all K simplices, what I'm doing is saying I'm picking out like a sub delta set of X and a sub delta set of Y that are isomorphic and I'm identifying those two, gluing them together. So as an exercise, I need to check this works. Um, so, <clears throat> e.g., oh, that is. Uh, you need the face maps to work. Uh, what else? We need in left, in right to be maps of delta sets and the universal property. That's the definition of a push out. Okay.
So for example, um, uh, of one of these, so what we can do is, you're right, <clears throat> so the boundary of delta n, the boundary of the n simplex, turns out to be the, the push out where it's, I'll define what this u is later, I mean not later, just in a moment. So u is um, so it's let's say it's roughly it's all the n minus one dimensional faces but one, <clears throat> and this is the other one. Uh, so I can draw what it looks like for n equals 3. So I have all these three faces. And then, uh, so this is u. <clears throat> it has an official name, but I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, and then this is the, this is the, last, um, the last face. And then the boundary is this uh, triangle. I mean, there's a stack of these, right? Because what you could do is pick um, different faces to pull off. So Space Gitter really wants to know what the name is. It's called a horn. Um, and it's written using a capital lambda with some decorations. So lambda is somehow like the n equals um, uh, n equals 2 case French horn yeah I mean n equals 2 it looks like uh, for instance this and this and then uh, this edge is delta 1 and then the boundary of delta 1 is the two points and so this kind of looks like a lambda, right? <clears throat> this here looks like a capital lambda, and so um, probably that's where it got its name. Okay. Uh, all right. So at some point, we'll probably calculate the cohomology of the boundary of the n-simplex using this, maybe. All right, so here's a lot of definitions today. So hopefully the examples have really um, helped illustrate some of them. So given delta set, all right, we can get a cochain complex. Well, a priori, it's a sequence of R modules. We get uh, R modules and maps. So zero. One. Uh, the definition of this is what we've seen already, but we can now just keep going arbitrarily high. Um, where 
so we, <clears throat> let's take a thing it's a map from x n to r and then we can apply delta n to it so delta n applied to g is now another function which is the alternating sum of the precompositions with the various face maps now this is a function from n plus 1 x n plus 1 to r And it's a cochain complex. It's again the calculation. A bunch of things cancel out in the sum because of the identities in the definition of a delta set and the fact that this sum is alternating. It extends the definition, uh, so it extends the lemma that we've seen so far a few times. Um, so let's call this. Now we're going to see a lot of notation that looks exactly like what we've been doing so far, but that's on purpose. Right, so now it's it's all the same notation except the x's are delta sets, not combinatorial surfaces. And so if this is a functor from the category of delta sets opposite, so it's a contravariant functor. Um, is it exact? Mm, no, you don't want it to be exact because then your delta set is highly boring. Um, and I suspect it's exact only for the empty delta set. I suspect. There is a thing you can do um, to adjust this and because the, the kernel of delta zero is almost always non-trivial. Um, whereas if this was exact, which is a extension of the short exact sequence concept we've had before, um, you, you can modify the sort of the dimension zero module just a little bit. And then you don't get that sort of residual stuff that hangs around even when you don't want it to be. Uh, Tommy, if it was exact, we could calculate its cohomology very easily. So it would be trivial. I mean, the, the cohomology modules would be zero. Uh, so if I have a map of delta sets, the... Yeah, Chris. Um, <clears throat> right. Yeah, so if I have a map of delta sets, I get a map of chain complexes. Um, and so we can define cohomology to be um, so H bullet is the cohomology of, well, let's do each individual one. It's the nth cohomology of this cochain complex and the h bullet is the direct sum of all the so it should be noted that the bullet on the c doesn't mean a direct sum that just means it's the whole cochain complex as um, the data of the modules and the maps whereas the cohomology doesn't have the data of the maps so it's just modules and so we can direct sum them together and just think of it as one big module. We haven't lost information. Uh, well, let's say n in z for now. We're going to see a little lemma. Okay, so here's some trivial, relatively trivial observations. Um, following from the properties of forming these modules of functions that we've seen before.
So if we take the disjoint, oh, we'll, we'll get to it. So um, first, for, no, I did want a K. Um, it's zero for K less than zero because the cochain complex is all zero, below zero. So if uh, X is <clears throat> n-dimensional, so remember this is XK is empty for K greater than n. X, uh, well that says it's at most n-dimensional. then the cohomology vanishes above uh, dimension n. Then that's, so that's cool. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, this means if I have an n-dimensional delta set, then uh, the direct sum of all the cohomology modules is a finite direct sum. So it's a more tractable object. So the first two just follow from the definition of like what are the functions from the empty set to R. It's the zero module. Um, so if X is a disjoint union of two things. Uh, let's not write it like that. Let's write directly. So we have H, K, uh, <coughs> is the direct sum, oh, that's not what I wanted. The disjoint union of X and Y, its cohomology is the direct sum of the, the cohomologies. And moreover, the, the map is induced by, um, there's a map from the left to the right. So if I take um, a function on x, k, disjoint union yk to r, so that represents a cohomology class in hk, then uh, I restrict, so let's say it's g, x, from xk, disjoint union yk to r, the equivalence class of that, because right, cohomology is a quotient module, what I do is I send it to uh, the represent the equivalence class of G restricted to K and G restricted to Y K. But these is this is in left pullback of G. This is in right pullback of G. All right, so there's a map we write down, and this turns out to be an isomorphism. Um, cool. So this is just sort of elementary properties of this stuff. So if we had a push out square, then we could look at the corresponding commutative square of cohomology as not anything useful um, but we can look at also the commutative square of um, code chain complexes and write down a short exact sequence of code chain complexes so let's say if um, <coughs> let's write it in words We can get a commutative square and then we get a um, 
uh, well, <clears throat> we get a sequence of complexes. All right, so that's just a general push out square. But if I have the case that uh, my um, sort of more precisely, so if I have uh, u intersect v sits inside u sits inside v sits inside x this is delta sets then I can get the same thing that we were discussing at the start of the lecture And the maps are defined the same way by restriction and by taking the difference uh, for this this map it's kind of slightly bent <clears throat> and now so before uh, we had uh, our code chain complexes were quite short right so for directed graphs there's just delta zero so two modules and one map for combinatorial surfaces we had three modules and two maps delta zero delta one and now we've got arbitrarily long, possibly, cochain complexes. And then a short exact sequence of those is in each dimension, like in the kth sort of dimensional spot inside the cochain complex, we've got a short exact sequence of R modules. So maybe I'm going to have a short aside on short exact sequences um, just to round out the lecture. So... So what are they good for? All right, so sort of up till now, I mean, we've done sort of really grindingly explicit by hand computations, like writing down matrices and functions and, and so on. That's just a like, it's like being an apprentice, an apprentice chef, and they say, cut this carrot. And then they say, now cut this giant bag of carrots. And then they, they say, okay, throw them all out. Get more carrots, chop more carrots until you get like, you can, you can chop carrots like a demon. <clears throat> and when you become, I don't know, a famous chef, someone else cuts your carrots for you. So we're not going to be calculating cohomology of anything using such like grindingly explicit calculations. Um, but you've got to start somewhere. And we're going to make the theorems do all the work for us. Yeah, Tyson, they also wear funny hats too. All right. <clears throat> so let me talk about short exact sequences. Um, all right, so let me write down what it is. It? So short exact sequence of modules A, B, C goes to zero. So this is injective. B to C is onto. And image of A, image of A. It's not what I want. Let's go this I, let's call this P. I of A equals kernel of P. Uh, it blocked uh, you are idiot yeah razor uh, trying to keep it family friendly here I mean I don't know how family friendly algebraic topology oh yeah 0 to A is injective but that's not what I meant I is injective Oh, 
All right, thanks, dear man. Um, all right, so that's what that is. So if uh, so, what does this mean? This means that C is a map um, from B mod the image of A, sort of the A, the image of A under I. <clears throat> This is well defined, the standard isomorphism theorems. Uh, this is an isomorphism. One of the you know, isomorphism theorems. I can never remember. I, I, I'm busy, Razor. Trying to write a lecture in my head, I'm getting distracted too. Um, <clears throat> So we saw some examples, uh, you know, like Z times P goes to Z, goes to Z mod P goes to zero, for instance, e.g. All right, <clears throat> but if we're over uh, R as a field, fourth isomorphism theorem, all right, um, If R, K, a field, then uh, R modules are vector spaces, and then uh, what this means is that if you choose a linear map from C to B, let's call this uh, S. with P compose S is the identity of C, so it's linear. That means we get an isomorphism of B with a direct sum of A and C. So Chris, injectivity is like exactly what exactness is. All right, so it's not a, it's part of the definition. Yeah. So um, I'm just sort of explaining like what does this mean in concrete terms? Um, so if we choose S, this gives us a specific isomorphism. So for instance, you take something in B and send it to um, <clears throat> S of P of B and take a minus that and then you put that bit in this slot oh yeah Chris exactness in is current with equals image plus injectness plus surjectivity um, so there's exactness at a general sequence at a single uh, module and that means uh, kernel equals image exactness at that point. But the short exact sequence is like it's exact everywhere. And so injectivity and surjectivity are just part of the it's exact at all the spots. Okay. Um, so this is, this is kind of a key fact. Uh, but you'll notice this is not true for the example I had up here. Right? Z is not z plus z mod p um, so over more general rings it might not be true but if you can find um, <clears throat> some sensible way to and so I should say this always exists for vector spaces But if you know um, if S exists for the general R module case, you still get this. Right. <clears throat> then 
um, we still we still get uh, b is isomorphic to the direct sum of a and c. But it, in general, you might say I know you might do things like so last thing before I wrap up we know A and C and we want B and so then we have to think a little bit harder so if we're over a field we always get B instantly it's a direct sum if we're not over a field, we might have to think a little bit harder about what possible Bs can fit in there. And then since all our like sequences of R modules come from topological things or combinatorial things, we have to start thinking about the topology or the combinatorics to see what is going on. Um, and I should note, if, if we know uh, A and B, then C is b mod i a and if we know uh, b and c then a is kernel of p <clears throat> i suppose we need to know and and the maps right we need to know what the maps are so the more interesting case is where it turns out we know A and C, but we don't know what B is. And so we're going to have this sort of stuff when we're doing homological algebras. You get more complicated or longer, longer exact sequences, not just three non-zero things. And we're going to play around with this stuff and how to calculate them. All right. So thank you. Um,